What's up, guys? Mr. Drosty back here to talk about another presidential election. This time we're looking at 1828, which to many is one of the most famous elections in American history because of how personal it got. We think of our presidential elections these days as always getting very, very personal. And that was no different in 1828. But for that era, things got incredibly personal. It's a really interesting election. So let's get to it. Of course, the 1828 election was a rematch from the 1824 election. And the 1824 election was uh, one of the most hotly contested in American history. Also one of the most controversial because you had the alleged corrupt bargain where John Quincy Adams became president after a vote in the House of Representatives. And that vote came about because although Andrew Jackson had received the most votes in the popular vote, and also the most votes in the Electoral College, he did not have a majority of the Electoral College. So the election was thrown to the House of Representatives, where it was alleged by Jackson supporters that Speaker of the House, Henry Clay, delivered the House vote for John Quincy Adams, who became the president, and Henry Clay became the Secretary of State. So four years later, Andrew Jackson is running again. His supporters are rapidly behind him. And he's going to win, and he's going to win in a landslide, as we will see. Uh, but the election is known for mudslinging. Mudslinging, again, is, is where things get personal between the candidates. And it all starts out when the Coffin Handbill is published by an editor out of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. The Coffin Handbill would feature six black coffins at the top, uh, talking about how Andrew Jackson had ordered the execution of six militiamen during the Creek Wars. There were another 12 coffins down the page to illustrate the deaths of regular soldiers as well as Indians during the Battle of Horseshoe Bend during the War of 1812, which the handbill was alleging Jackson was also responsible for. There was other attacks on Jackson's character throughout the campaign as well as his wife's character. Uh, Andrew Jackson and, and his wife had been married nearly 40 years earlier, and it was found out through a newspaper editor that uh, this old story was brought about, about how Rachel Jackson and Andrew had been married before, the, the, uh, before Rachel's divorce to her first husband had officially gone through. So Jackson, had uh, Rachel Jackson had technically been married to Andrew and her former husband, uh, legally, there was some overlap. They were married at the same time, so they called Rachel a bigamist. Her name was dragged through the mud. They were just overall just really, really nasty to Rachel Jackson. When Jackson, Andrew Jackson, wins the election, Rachel Jackson never makes it to see her husband become president. She had a heart attack in that period between the election and the inauguration, and Andrew Jackson never forgave his political enemies for her death. He claimed, especially Henry Clay, who knew the newspaper editor who dragged out this story, he blamed them for his for his wife's death. And it was a very, very sad situation, uh, Rachel Jackson passing away between the election and the inauguration day. There was also a story brought back uh, about how Andrew Jackson had stabbed a man named Samuel Jackson not that Samuel Jackson, but a man named Samuel Jackson in the streets of Nashville. Um, that was published throughout the country. All this was designed to get people to question the character of Andrew Jackson and whether he should serve as president. Um, now, the Jackson people retaliated. They talked about how when uh, John Quincy Adams was the minister to Russia, he had allegedly uh, sought about the services of a young woman for the Tsar of Russia. There was also a story about how uh, John Quincy Adams had used taxpayer money to install a pool table in the White House, and that was a big controversy, believe it or not, at the time. Although that story was not true, John Quincy Adams had actually used his own money for the pool table, but yes, he did like to, to play pool. So when historians look back on what happened here between John Quincy Adams and Andrew Jackson, for the most part, the stories about Andrew Jackson were in fact true. Uh, and the stories that were pushed about John Quincy Adams in retaliation were mostly false. 
But Jackson was very much able to leverage himself as the working class hero. He was legitimately someone who had come from almost nothing to become a successful general. And then, of course, as he would become here, the president of the United States. There's a picture of the coffin handbill. But this is how the election shakes out. And as you can see, Jackson, very strong uh, in the South, in the West. John Quincy Adams up in the Northeast, the New England area where he was from, he won some electoral votes. But altogether, uh, Andrew Jackson won 60, 68% of the electoral college. So a strong majority, which he needed to be elected president. And in the popular vote, he won by 12 points. So resounding victory for Andrew Jackson. This is going to usher in what we call the age of Jackson and a two-term presidency. So here's a picture of Andrew Jackson taking the oath of office in March of 1829. As I said, unfortunately, his wife, Rachel, did not live to see him become the president because she had that heart attack after the very, very stressful campaign of 1828, which saw her character dragged through the mud. One of the famous stories about uh, Jackson's inauguration in March of 1829 is that he kind of opened up D.C. to all of his supporters, you know, all these common men and their families came to D.C. to celebrate his inauguration. And there was this famous party at the White House. In those days, anyone could show up at the White House and gain admittance. And so there was this party. Uh, it's probably, though, kind of exaggerated uh, about what happened that night at the White House. You can see I have an article linked down here to a wild night at the White House. Um, how wild it got, like I said, it's probably exaggerated because a lot of those stories were pushed by the Adams supporters who kind of looked down upon the Jackson supporters. So they probably exaggerated just how much they destroyed, allegedly, the White House and the drapes and the carpets in the White House. There was a massive party. Did it get out of hand, like the story said? Probably exaggerated a little bit to make, by the Adams supporters to make uh, Jackson supporters you know, kind of look lower, lower class. So when Jackson comes in, he ushers in something that we would refer to as the spoils system. And that is, you know, to the victor go the spoils. When you take over, you make your supporters appointments in the government. That would be like cabinet offices, obviously, which was something that was typical before Jackson, but even like lower level jobs in the government, everything down to like mail sorters. Jackson would come in, you know, he wants to replace all the Adams people because of this hatred between the two men with his own people. And uh, even on inauguration day, that hatred between Jackson and Adams carried through. Uh, there was the tradition that the incoming president would pay a special visit to the outgoing president at the White House. And Jackson refused to do that. And, and then in turn, uh, John Quincy Adams refused to attend the inauguration of the new president, Andrew Jackson. There, are, there were also structural changes uh, coming out of the election of 1828. So the new Democratic Party now is going to replace the more traditional congressional caucus system in nominating people with a, uh, a new nominating convention, which is going to change over the decades. But that was a change going on. Uh, in the electoral process. And then in looking at the people that supported Jackson, you know, the working class people and his new Democratic Party, they made a change to who could vote in American elections. You know, prior to this, you had to have property ownership. That was no longer going to be a requirement moving forward in order to vote in American elections. Um, this also followed a trend of more people moving to the cities where they were now renting property because of this uh, coming industrial revolution. Uh, because of that, of course, less people would be able to vote because they weren't owning property. So with the urbanization of America, they needed to change the way that the electoral system worked. But that's the election of 1828. That's how Andrew Jackson becomes president of the United States. And as we're going to see now moving forward in history, the 1830s are a time of massive change. It's a time of what they call Jacksonian democracy in the age of Jackson. And that's how Andrew Jackson became president in 1828. We'll see you guys next time. If you like this video, don't forget to subscribe by clicking the subscribe button down below and leave a comment and leave a thumbs up if you like this video. I'm Mr. Drosty. We will see you guys next time.